Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host here. My guest today is Ellen Lewis, uh, owner of Crazy For You Yarn in Maryland. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Irina. And you're also a fellow YouTuber, so we have a lot to cover today this, between the store and the YouTube. And I've been binge watching your YouTube channel, so I have a lot of questions to ask about that. <laughs> like, how is it so too. bad? <laughs> No, I, like I actually like really love it because, well, to me, you you are walking on this like edge of being the store owner and promoting the yarn and yet being brutally honest about what works and what doesn't. And I love that. And you walk that line brilliantly. So I, I watched today the fashion show that you did for Nora Yarns. And I'm a huge fan of that uh, line. They, they have beautiful colors, but... Oftentimes, when I look at some of their yarn, I'm like, it's gorgeous, but what do I do with that? So to see you guys model it for all different body types and all different sizes was actually like really interesting for me. Thank you. Let's Thank you. It's a lot go, of fun to do. Let's go a little bit back. Tell okay. me like how you started meeting. When did it happen? Like, tell me a little bit about your story. Okay. All right. Right. So, um, I grew up doing needlepoint, right? My mother was a big needlepoint, cruel embroidery, all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, you, <laughs> there's only so much stuff you can, only so much needlepoint you can have in your life, right? right. Um, and so I started knitting when I was in college. I had always been afraid because I thought that I couldn't possibly have my stitches be even and I was thinking it would be horrible. But um, I saw a friend knitting and I thought, you know, that looks great. I want to do that. And she goes, you know what, Ellen, it's really easy. So I took myself off to, um, to, um, Woolworths. Do you know what Woolworths is? It's yeah. like a five and dime. And I got myself this skein of brushed acrylic and these aluminum, you know, 12, 14 inch needles and a book that said, learn to knit <laughs> because this was, this was 1983, right? There, there was no YouTube. And so I'm, I'm looking at the book and it said, thou shalt hold your needles this way. Thou shalt hold your yarn this way. And it had the little pictures and, um, you know, and I don't know what it was, but I was in love. I, I got to be just obsessed, you know, and, um, I don't know. I just really fell in love with, with the whole process. And I found out because I looked in the yellow pages that there was actually a yarn store in my college town. And I went up there and they were so wonderful. They were like exactly what a yarn store should be. You know, they were warm and welcoming and encouraging and empowering and just amazing. And, you know, somewhere in the back of my head, I always thought I would love to do this one day. Um, but, you know, nobody graduates from college and says, oh, I think I'll own a I'll start a specialty <laughs> retail <laughs> store. Right. So I went off and I did all these, you know, all these things. I was in government for, you know, 20 some years, but I always knit and I always had this kind of in the back of my mind that this was something I would love to do. And then, you know, the stars aligned and I did. So, yay. <laughs> well, when people think about having a yarn store, there is this glamorous imagination like the picture that the, you're surrounded by all this beautiful yarn and you see the need and people come and say hello and you like explain them something and then you see the need together how is it to run a yarn store well that is definitely part of it okay I mean I don't want to tell you that that's not part of it and that is the very best of it okay I used to say that it's like um, and I love to entertain. It's like having people over all the time with your friends. You can sit and knit, um, but you don't have to clean your house, right? But but that is just a really small part of it. I mean, there's all the the ordering and the the planning. I mean, ordering yarn is just one piece of it because you know you have to figure out what is everybody going to do with this. You know, when I opened a yarn store, that was in the days before Ravelry. That was 2004. So most of your yarn companies had patterns that went with the yarn. So it wasn't all that challenging, but now a lot of yarns, yarn companies don't really have patterns and there's Ravelry and there's all these great independent designers. So it's, there's a lot of um, sort of thinking about, well, okay, what is this yarn great for? Which patterns do we want to feature? What, you know, and kind of back and forth with that, like, 
marrying the yarns that you're going to carry to the patterns that are going to resonate with your people. So that's part of it. And, you know, and then there's the, you know, the bookkeeping and the marketing and the social media and all that changing prices and stocking the shelves is decidedly unglamorous. <laughs> well, tell me about how your team grew because you started it all by yourself. Like how did it go, go from that to where it is now? So I did, I started all by myself and um, I had a friend who knit and she would come in and she would shop with me and we had a mutual friend and the mutual friend said so it was Beth the mutual friend Kathy the knitter and she said you know Kathy wouldn't you wouldn't you just love to work in Ellen's store and she said I would so love to work in Ellen's store I had never even thought about that Kathy would want to work in the store so Beth came and she goes you know Ellen just just you know Word to the wise, Kathy would love to work in your store. So I had her come on Thursdays because Thursdays was kind of a slow day. And she came in and she covered Thursdays for me. And that was wonderful because that allowed me to kind of get out of the day to day and sort of think maybe a little bit more strategically. At that point, I was starting to put together my newsletter that I put out. Boy, at that point, it was once a quarter. Um, I did a printed newsletter. It was multiple pages and I mailed it out. You know, oh my gosh, bulk mailing <laughs> back in the day. And then, you know, Kathy got, um, Kathy was a reserve officer and she got called up to Iraq. And so she had to go off and I needed, I'd gotten quite used to having somebody. And that's when Ginny came. So Ginny, I asked Ginny if she would, would work in the shop. It was just a you know, just a one day thing. And then it got to be a couple days. And I realized that um, I really wanted to have as a goal, me not have to physically be in the shop covering shop hours at all. So what did I have to do to kind of make that happen? What did my sales have to look like? And so I have, I have part-time people. I don't have any, I don't have like a full-time manager, but I have um, three part-time people and then some, you know, very part-time people that that do work at home on things like the database and and stuff. But it's really nice to have people who get where you're coming from, are really invested in your business that you can can throw ideas around with and they all bring something really different and really special to the table. And it's a a beautiful kind of cohesive group where we we all come together we all have kind of our own specialties but we share this common goal of serving our knitters right well when you started you were a knitter but then in your um lives you often mentioned that like oh i need to learn crochet i need to learn crochet because like the yarn store is for everyone it's not just for knitters it's for crocheters it's for people who do whatever this yarn right yes do you feel like your lack of expertise in crocheting makes you like hire people who's going to cover it? Like, do you feel like you have to be an expert to run a yarn store? Well, like I said, I think we all have to have our own expertise and, and we do. And one of the things, you know, if you sign up for my newsletter, I send you a series of emails and one of them is meet the team. And so like, Ginny is what I call the technical genius. And if there's a complicated uh, technique or, you know, some new thing and I'll say, hey, what do you think about this? I'll say, go and look at this. And she'll come back and, you know, she'll have it all figured out. And it's like, do we want to offer a class on that? Is that a thing? And Mary is, um, she's our crocheter. So she teaches all of the crochet classes and, um, supports our crocheters. Like I say, I only know enough to be dangerous. I, I mean, I know the basics, but I, I'm not, I'm not skilled in it enough to really kind of answer those super hard advanced crochet questions. I'm always going to defer them to somebody else and say, I'm really sorry, this isn't where I'm the strongest, you know, and, and they'll do the same. Like I'm kind of a extremely meticulous on a sweater fit and finishing. So if there's, you know, somebody struggling with finishing, um, seaming, all that stuff, picking up stitches, they're going to say, hey, you know, you really want to get Ellen's eyes on that. You know, so well, let, let me ask you something like when 
you think of a cookbook recipe, right? Nobody actually measures it in teaspoons. I mean, unless it's baking probably, but like for cooking, people just eyeball stuff, right? They take it as like a recipe of like the general idea and then you improvise. It's a suggestion. Right. Is pattern a suggestion to you or is it like letter by letter following? Like how do you treat patterns? Well, Once upon a time, I treated patterns like baking recipe instructions, and I made them exactly as directed. And that's how I realized that my my body wasn't banana bread. You know, it it wasn't, it it didn't fit me the way it should. And um, so the first instance that I had with that was this adorable sweater that was from the um, the Pearl Stitch by Sally Melville. So that's going way back. It was this cute little um, kind of a roll neck sleeveless with some waist shaping. And I made it exactly as written. And the waist hit me kind of right here. <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is not working for me. And I had kind of an aha moment that said, all right, the, the pattern is written for a body and that's not the body that you have. So how do you, Ellen, make something to fit you, right? So I had to learn how to make those adjustments. So if that's what you mean by like cookie cutter um, or following the recipe, no, I don't typically follow the recipe because if it's a, if it's a pattern with shaping, I recognize that that my body is not necessarily the same as the CYCA standard that that was designed for. And, right. and I get it. Designers have to design to a standard, right? And our job as knitters is to customize those patterns so that they fit us the way we like them to, you know? And that's my superpower. <laughs> Well, I also love that you bring it on your YouTube because like the last thing that I watched was your uh, fashion demo of the Noro yarn samples. And there was like three ladies, right? Each with completely different sizing and like different body style. And you tried some of the same tops. And that was actually like really interesting to see how like one can be like very complimentary on one person and look like very blown and somebody else right and then there is the whole the yarn choice and all of that and I love that you educate your viewers about how to supplement one kind of yarn for another and how to like how to decide what works for you thank you how do you decide which yarn you're going to carry in your store well let's see um I feel pretty strongly about all right So (laughs) owning a yarn store, you have a lot of freedom to make choices, right? And I only work with companies that are pleasant to deal with. I know this this sounds so random and probably really the stupidest business decision ever in the history of the universe, but it's how I feel comfortable. I don't like to deal with companies that are unpleasant or unscrupulous or don't care about um, the environment or you know, other kinds of things. I like, um, like I carry Manos. I love that they are empowering women in South America. I love that they are distributed in the United States by a woman-owned company, okay? You know, I carry a ton of Noro. I love the whole Noro aesthetic. I love that they are extremely aware of the impact that their business has on the environment. They you know, none of their raw materials are used until Mr. Noro, he's passed away now, but he would visit each and every place where he sourced his raw materials. And he was sure that the animals were well cared for and the whole process, the dye process, the use of water was really um, minimally impactful. You know, they're, they're very careful about that. I talk about this a lot. I have a video on, you know, Noro, is it really that special? I talk a lot about that. Um, So that's important to me. And I I also carry Rowan. I I like Rowan a lot um, because again, they have a really beautiful 
designer led pattern line that resonates with a lot of my knitters. Um, and what really brought me back to Rowan was their new line mode, which is a much younger, a much more, um, they call it fashion reflective, um, kind of capsule wardrobe concept. So for me, that's huge. So, so there are, you know, there are different reasons. Um, there are co some companies that I j just don't carry because, um, their, their aesthetic or their, um, their business practices don't jive with my preferred way of doing things. Right. Well, like one of my sort of pet peeves is walking into like any store in the United States and seeing the same designs in every store, <laughs> you know, and not that I'm against any famous designer out there. Like I love the fact that there are some huge rock and roll names there, but I feel like there are hundreds of thousands of designers who have very hard time of promoting their designs and making a name for themselves. What's your approach? And I understand that it's like you are in the place of business and popular names bring crowd and popular yarns bring crowd. What's your approach? How to balance that? How to help the underdog and spotlight them while still maintaining your business and making it success? That's a, that's a really brilliant question. And I know exactly what you mean because you do, you walk in and you see however many of that that same design. I sort of feel like if people, if if a customer is kind of on that, they're going to walk in with that pattern and I know what to give them for that. But, but it is kind of our job to find more niche, niche designers. It's, it's a tough, it's a tough balance because the designers that have had thousands of people make their stuff is kind of proven you know, and taking a chance on a designer that maybe has only had a few people make their stuff, then that is, um, you know, then, then you bear that risk, you know, you have to knit it up and you have to make sure that it's good. And I think that's worthwhile doing, but I don't have a problem, um, like using designers that are not so uber popular. I'm, I'm old school. I like, I like seeming, <laughs> I like classic construction. Um, so when I'm looking for a pattern on Ravelry, I'm usually entering search terms like I want something that's knit from, you know, from the bottom up in pieces and seams. So I, I love Julie Hoover and I have a whole list of designers that I really like that design that way that aren't like super stars in the designing world, if you know what I mean. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you ever buy yarn, like being sure that it's going to fly off the shelves and nobody buys it? Oh my gosh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we all do. And um, so we think about yarns when we're buying them as yarns that have instant, what we call shelf appeal, and then yarns that don't. So the yarns that have shelf appeal, you know, they're, they have really beautiful colors and they have this, you know, this halo about them, like Ilamani Amelie, which is very similar to Wolf Folk Loft. You know, it just, it's just so touchable. You know, it's like a kitten lying there. You just want to reach out and pet it. You know, of course it's going to fly off the shelf, but then there are other yarns that need a little more love you know, they, they need a big swatch or a sample garment knitted in them so that people can see how they respond to a nice warm bath and how the fibers bloom after they've been, been, you know, blocked and, and opened up. So, um, yeah, you, and the fibers that, or the yarns that I buy that don't fly off the shelf, it's usually because they don't have that shelf appeal and, I haven't taken, you know, it's on me. I haven't taken enough time to nurture them and to present them in their best light. So when that happens, before I, you know, mark it down and say, oh, you're no good, we'll try to, you know, knit something with it and kind of present it and promote it out there. So it has a chance to shine too. Well, how did you learn about marketing at all? Because it's a completely different side of business. It's one thing to just be able to knit something it's completely other side to be able to convince people to buy it. 
Trial and error. I mean, there. I don't have an MBA. I don't have a background in business. Um, I I do have some courses in marketing that I took when I thought I was going to go and get an MBA. Took some courses in marketing. I took some courses in management. Um, but you know, it's it's really been kind of a learn as you go, and I'm still learning. I'm not the best at it. I mean, I I wish I were so much better. There's so many more things, I should be doing and could be doing. It's, you know, it's about balancing the time. I'm, I'm not the best at, at putting myself out there. I'm not a, um, I'm just not a real markety kind of, kind of person. I, you know, maybe that's to my detriment, but um, I don't know. I, 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 that's a really horrible answer to your question. I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's honest. And if I'm nothing else, I'm completely honest. Well, that's what I love about your YouTube channel because, and I mentioned it to you before we started this uh, interview that I found it like very refreshing that if you dislike some part of the design, if something doesn't work, you'll explain why it doesn't work, why it bothers you, what you would have done differently and how something that works on somebody else doesn't work for you or like what you personally like or dislike, like... Uh, tying the belt around your waist is not your kind of tea so you would have done it differently and I find it like very interesting because you still promote the yarn that it's made with and you still promote those designs by showing it to everyone but you're giving your like very honest opinion about who it would be perfect for and who it wouldn't be right be because you know, there's a million styles, there's are millions of styles in the world. And that's what's so beautiful about us all is that we're all different. We all have different bodies. We all have different tastes. We all have different personal style goals. So um, it's, it's lovely that we can knit things to suit ourselves exactly right. And Sometimes you'll see it and you'll say, oh yeah, that's me. I, I love that. I can wear that. And, and sometimes you, you see something and you think, oh, that's really cute on the model and you knit it and you realize that it's not right for you. And I think that's one of the most disappointing things that can happen to us as a knitter is to spend the time choosing the yarn and knitting the thing and putting it all together and putting it on and realizing, yeah, this isn't me at all. And it's so disappointing. So I do try to help knitters identify their personal style as well as their measurements, you know, their likes and dislikes. Um, and then to sort of see, to, to be able to look through a collection like that, that Noro magazine. And what I love about it is it does have styles to suit every single type of, you know, style preference. There's that really cute little, um, I call it um, orange sherbet sort of little t-shirt, which is so cute for people who wear t-shirts. You know, again, I don't wear t-shirts at all ever, <laughs> but if you wear a t-shirt, I think that's great. Um, a lot of people think, oh, I don't knit because I don't wear that kind of sweater or whatever. I would, I would never wear, you know, what you're wearing, Ellen, or whatever, but you know, I just wear t-shirts. So, okay. So knit a t-shirt or I really am more comfortable in a sweatshirt. Well, let's knit you a beautiful sweatshirt, you know, but, but you have to know what it is that you like. And that's sort of a, a trial and error going through your wardrobe and figuring out what you wear all the time. And what is it about that thing that you choose to wear all the time that you love that you could find in a knitting pattern and recreate so that you're then knitting the garments that you have as core elements in your wardrobe and what are you not wearing what are the things in your wardrobe that hang there week after week after week that you don't wear why don't you wear them what is it about it that you don't like let's evaluate that let's analyze that and and stay away from those things when we're choosing designs for ourselves well, when you started knitting, it was just this hobby, right? Like you just enjoyed the process. Is the end, like end product important to you now? Do you care about like if something doesn't fit correctly, if something not what you imagine it's going to be, are you truly disappointed or you still enjoy the process and you don't care? And it's like next project. I learned something, but next. 
Well, I do love the process. I am disappointed if it doesn't um, fit or look good on me, but I don't keep it in my wardrobe. I gift it <laughs> to somebody else. Or we have sample sales in the shop a couple times a year, and it will just go in the sample sale pile, right? There's a beautiful hand-knit sweater that doesn't suit me. I mean, it took me a long time to figure out that tailored vests, not good. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look good in those, Ellen. They're horrible. Don't knit those because, because they're so appealing and, and so easy to knit and they really showcase the yarn, but no, not for me. T-shirts, not for me. Um, but yeah. I find it interesting because like, I feel like I'm changing as a knitter like every year and I don't have as much experience as you do. Like I only started knitting five years ago, but I find that I'm learning something new with every project. And oftentimes I'll do a project without plan of wearing it necessarily, just to, to learn something new, just to see how it actually works and to see if I can, if I'm capable of doing it, if I'm actually on the level of being capable of getting through the pattern. So like, which is one of the reasons I love test knitting because oftentimes the designer would be like, would you like to test knit this for me? And I'm like, I never have done a sweater. And they're like, brilliant, here's the pattern, right? And they would trust in my abilities much more than I would trust in my own abilities. So to me, it's like oftentimes, like I'm I, I'm definitely learning some new skills and some new ga gaining, like some deeper understanding of knitting in general, like through every project. That's exactly what I think what you should do. And I mean, I think probably for a designer, the fact that you have five years of knitting under your belt is exactly what they want. Because yes. if only expert knitters are knitting their stuff, how are they going to know how, you know, a full range of knitters are going to respond? So you're doing such a great service. And that's definitely like a valid point because I had the situation when, there was a shawl knitted, tested and out there for two years. And then I did a knit along for that. And I invited all the new knitters to join me. And suddenly we all ran into a mistake that like experts just flew over. They didn't even notice it because they understood what it meant. And the newbies didn't, you know, they just literally like read the pattern and did what the pattern said and not what it meant. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, a, it's usually like very helpful to have a fresh eye of somebody who doesn't know how to do it. Do you design at all? Uh, not officially. Like, I mean, I, I play with patterns. I change things. I come up with stuff, but like I haven't published anything. And I'm not sure I really want to at this point. I might change my mind later, but I feel like there is a place for designers and there's definitely place for makers and not, right now I'm enjoying being the maker right right and learning stuff I mean I think honestly as long as I've been knitting and as many sweaters and stuff that I've done I still learn stuff every project you know and what's what's your like least favorite thing about running a business oh my gosh um it's you know it can be it can be really thankless um, and it can feel sort of lonely, you know, aside from my team. And um, I'm also the president of the local business association. Aside from that very small group of people who are doing exactly, you know, in my, on my team or, you know, doing exactly what I'm doing on their own business, <clears throat> people don't really get it. I mean, people who go to their job and, you know, they do their work. And at the end of the day, they come home and they're done and they don't think about it again until the next day. Um, so it, it is, it is tough to be in that role and not have people understand that you're thinking about this 24 seven. I mean, I go to sleep thinking about this. I sometimes lie awake thinking about this. I wake up in the morning thinking about this. And um, even when I'm on, on holiday, it's hard for me to get away. So 
I guess that's, that's it is that it really is your whole life, right. you know? And I mean, it's I- funny because people really don't get it. People don't understand how, like what they consider a light hobby, something you do just for meditation can be your whole life. Like people don't understand that, that it can be so all involving. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I mean, I really do enjoy it. Don't get me wrong. I, I like it. I love that I'm learning stuff all the time. I'm learning a lot of the tech stuff. So I wasn't doing YouTube or any of that stuff until the pandemic. And um, so the row and line launched in like end of February, beginning of March. And I had trunk shows scheduled. I had all this new yarn and the store was shut down. So, you know, what do you do? How do you, how do you handle that? And, you know, we all, we all had to quick, like a bunny, learn how to use live and video and and all this stuff. And I'd had a YouTube channel since 2012. And I made all these, you know, these beginning knitting videos. And then I didn't do anything with it for, well, 2020. (laughs) Um, And, and, you know, we, we had this you know, learning from a drinking from a fire hose kind of learning um, that does sort of force you to learn. And as tough as it was and as steep as the learning curve was, it was kind of exciting, you know, to learn all this sort of new stuff and to think, oh, YouTube isn't so bad and I don't have to be perfect. And and that's why I do lives because I'm not perfect. Um, I'm like <laughs> incredibly imperfect. Um, but I'm okay with that. And a live people know that it's not recorded and edited and, you know, perfectly lit and all that. It's, it's real and Mm -hmm. that's okay. Well, when, like you're talking about COVID time, was that also invigorating because you sort of coming to a completely different understanding of the business opportunities, like of what's possible? Yeah, hundred percent. Again, I had a an e-commerce site since 2012, and I'd sort of been putting a little stuff up there, and you know, selling this and that. But I hadn't ever really looked at that as this is a thing you need to do right now and fast, and you need to to get your marketing message out, and you need to say buy this. <laughs> right. And, and honestly, there's a a wonderful group of yarn store owners. Um, on in a Facebook group that I'm in and they you know everybody was kind of feeling like well we're in this together and people had brilliant ideas and they shared that out and we all kind of shared what we were doing and what worked and what we found and um, I don't think I certainly wouldn't have gotten through it without the support of those women who owned local yarn stores and were so generous with their creativity and inspiration and time and just everything. Well, you mentioned that one of your goals was not having to be in the store on any given day, the, to have that freedom of just like doing something else, right? Working on something else. Do you ever get burnt out with the business? Because it's like, uh, it's a routine. It's every day. You have to open, you have to show up. Like somebody has to, it's your responsibility that somebody is going to be there. Somebody is going to open the door. Somebody is going to stuff those shelves. Somebody is going to, ring that register do you ever get tired of it no because every day is different i mean again i'm not the one opening the door every day i'm i'm in the shop every sunday from one to four and i love that because it really does sort of keep me connected um but the other days that we're open and we're open seven days a week, it's somebody else, you know, opening that door. And my day might be like Mondays. I write my newsletter. Okay. Um, and that takes a lot of time. And, and, you know, other days during the week, I'm researching for YouTube content, or I'm making a, you know, social media, or I'm learning about the software that I've invested in, or, you know, doing fun things like this interview. <laughs> You have at least just being by yourself in the store and meeting and greeting the people who walk in. I love that. I love that. If nobody's in the store, I'm probably stocking the shelves or, you know, doing some other menial task like um, vacuuming or 
call it trash. <laughs> but when people are in the store, you know, when somebody comes into the yarn store on a day just to hang out, and we don't really have like set knit nights or anything like that. I close my newsletter every every week with, I look forward to seeing you in the shop and around the table. You are always welcome here. And I truly mean that. People say, oh, when can I come in and knit? It's like, Anytime you want, you know, come in. There's there's always somebody here who's going to be glad to see you. So even if it's just you, you just want to run away from home for an hour and come and knit. I think the expectation is that not only are they going to have a quiet, very calm um, place to be at the table, there's also going to be somebody there who is going to respect their desire for companionable silence or, you know, be an ear for them or, you know, maybe help them. So I do try to, you know, sit down at the table when, when somebody else is, is in the shop. Does that, does that make sense? Right. Yeah. When you started this store, you probably couldn't imagine what it's going to be like today. Do you have a vision for what it's going to be like in the next 10 years? Oh, I think about this all the time. You know, that marketing stuff I talked about, how I have to learn all the time about the marketing stuff. <laughs> I read all of these things and, you know, they do talk about what does your store look like or what does your business look like in 10 years? I mean, I would love to grow my YouTube channel. Um, I would love to have um, more, more classes in the shop. Um, we are still a very small team and I guess more of the same, you know, Growing doesn't necessarily mean getting bigger. I think it can mean flourishing and thriving. So I would like to have more of what we've what we've got. And I would like to maybe start a kind of a little a pattern line of basics because every time I do um, a pattern for myself, people say, oh, what is that pattern? And, you know, maybe it's something I've put together just for me. And I would like to maybe offer that. So that's something that would be kind of fun. Um, gosh, it's, it's still not, not fleshed out. I do have a, a growing membership site, which is so important to me. Um, what has happened over the past almost 20 years now since I started, it was so different in 2004. There wasn't, um, the internet was just sort of coming to, it was just sort of growing. The internet was just growing. And and then in 2007, um, Ravelry came along. And, you know, in that time, there was a whole lot of online offerings of yarn. And I it is tough for a lot of businesses to compete in that. And I have seen sadly, a lot of yarn stores close. And that leaves a lot of knitters without that space, right. you know, that friendly table to go and be at when they, when they need it. So my membership site is focused on helping women create garments they're proud to wear that fit perfectly and all of that. But it also has as a component, some community. So we meet and we are together in person that way kind of around the table. Those sessions are called the magic table. And, and it is offering guidance and support and community for knitters who have lost a local yarn store near them, which I think is just so sad. It used to be there is a, a local yarn store in every community on the corner of every little town. And we've lost that. So we have to find a way to, to offer that community to all of the knitters who are still there and looking for support and guidance. Is your yarn store your personal stash? <laughs> I do have a few, a few things here at the house. So like if something is, um, I don't take stuff off the shelf and, and bring it home unless I'm going to actively knit something with it. But if something is like, you know, Noro's discontinuing colors all the time and yarns all the time. So if there's a particular color of Noro that's being discontinued and I really love it, I will grab, I'll grab that and take it home. Because I feel really strongly about not having discontinued yarns on my shelf. You know, I, I like to keep things current and fresh and 
Um, so if it's discontinued I'm, and I can't get more of it, I'll, I'll take it and take it home. But it is kind of nice to be able to say, I could do anything. I mean, I just brought in a beautiful line of um, cashmere from Clinton Hill, another woman owned company and love her very beautiful, personable kind of owner. Um, yeah, I, lo I love having it there. I don't have to do anything with it. But knowing that I could, that's the same thing as stash, right? <laughs> right. Absolutely. How do you define stash? Does it have to be dedicated to a particular project or? Um, mine is absolutely not. I mean, I'm, I'm like deep believer that yarn collecting and curating your yarn collection and collecting patterns and knitting are like three absolutely different hobbies that have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> you have quite a stash behind you. Is that your stash? I do. Yeah. And it's a part of it. That is very impressive. <laughs> but But I feel like it's there, there come times when I'm like I'm using so much of it and then I'm like replenishing it but there's like this definitely time when I'm just coming to that shell and tell them like talk to me you know and something will call my name and I'm gonna grab those skeins and make something with it so, so are you uh yarn first or pattern first I'm definitely separate yarn from pattern <laughs> Because sometimes I see yarn and I'm I'm gonna be like, oh my god, that would make a perfect shawl, a perfect sweater. And then sometimes I'll see the pattern and I'm like, oh, I have to make it. So what do I have? So it's like I'm I can't define myself. <laughs> you mentioned at the very beginning that like you couldn't imagine yourself going from college straight into like owning a yarn store. And so you had you did some other stuff. How is your family, your friends reacting to the fact that meeting is your life now? You know, I'm always really flattered when my friends are like, oh, it's so cool that you own your own business. Because I think, I don't know, we, you know, we all have at some level imposter syndrome, you know, you're familiar with that term, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we all have that. And so, um, I probably worry about it more than, than anybody. My, my friends and family have been incredibly supportive. I worked from 1985 when I graduated college. I worked straight through to 1992 when I had my first daughter. So I started growing a family in 1992 and I was doing that through 2002. So my last baby was born in 2002. And he was two years old when I had the yarn store. So I had sort of phased out my, my right. corporate or, or government work. And I was just doing some little part-time stuff. So it wasn't like a big jump from one. Thing. never had a big, powerful corporate job. I wasn't like right. an executive or anything that, oh, I'm going to leave it all behind and open a yarn store. I mean, that would have been a beautiful, fun and dramatic thing, but that's <laughs> not, that's not how it happened. Um, but do you yeah. ever like question, like, was it the right decision? Do you ever think like, oh, I should have just gone back to corporate work? I never think that. I never, ever think that. I I really am happy doing what I do. I, I love it um, in a way that's hard to describe. I love all the different aspects. I love having been able to meet some of the people that I would never have been able to connect with. Right. I mean, I totally hear you because that's my favorite part about me starting this channel. It wasn't something I was planning on or wasn't something I even thought through when I started. It was sort of like, figure it out as you go. But my absolute favorite thing about having this channel is meeting all the people who, like you, are guests of my channel and getting to know them and coming to fiber festivals and seeing them in person, it's like absolute high. It's like my playground, you know? It's very cool. I mean, what you do is so interesting and you do have a wonderful opportunity to meet some amazing people. You know, I'm sure you've met all the, all the famous people that we all, we call, I call them the Nitterati. <laughs> <laughs> I was at Vogue Knitting Live and I, I got to meet Hohi Locatelli and I thought that was just, you know, really cool. Well, she's the next person I would love to have on my channel. So if anybody knows Hohi personally, please tell her to 
be a guest of my channel because I would love that. I tried contacting her, but she's like super busy, but she's in Milan right now. I think it is. Yeah. She's uh, this Mayak Fiber who I just interviewed recently. <laughs> so I know a lot of people who know Hohi and it's just like matter of time, but like I, it's, uh, she's one of my dream guests for the future. She seems just again, so genuine and so lovely and um, just so incredibly talented very very modest and poised and yeah she's she's all those things I think and I love the fact that there's like vast variety of patterns that she creates from something super simple to like very complex so I love mm -hmm. about her she's like very uh functional designer for every every kind of knitter out there isn't she a trained physician she is yeah, yeah. that's really something huh yeah, so like that was another person who changed her career into knitting. Yeah, I, mean, I would I would love to visit your store one day and just take a tour because I don't know why, but there is this instant connection that I felt like, and I feel like uh, it it can't be a bad experience coming to your store just because of your personality. Like it has to be great. <laughs> oh, thank you. We do really, really. Um, you know, when I hire people, I know who I want in the, in the shop. And honestly, Ginny's been with me since 2007 and Mary's been with me since 2009 and Jenny's been with me since 2010. So it's, a, you know, it's a team that's been together a long time, but I always say I hire for personality first because some of that stuff you just can't really teach. I can teach anybody to knit. I can share with them, you know, what I know, but you can't teach somebody to really like people. And that's the most important aspect of owning a specialty retail store is that, you know, you're open to the public and you just have to really meet people where they are and be genuinely glad to see them and have a true desire to serve. You know, that's, that's what it's about. When somebody comes in, I mean, you want, they they want some kind of help, whether it's um, choosing the yarn or understanding something or help with the project or or whatever. And you have to have kind of this strong desire to serve them and help them get where they want to go. So I mean, I think that's that's key. Right. So well, it does make it fun. If somebody's like considering opening a yarn store in today's economy, in today's day and age, what would be your advice? Uh, let's see. Well, <laughs> choose the yarn and the, the companies that you want to work with really carefully. Make sure that you, um, that you, before you bring any yarn, maybe you know what you want to, um, make with it, figure out sort of what your niche is. Look around to either yarn stores near you or, or close what are they not offering? What are you passionate about? And what is going to be kind of your take on the yarn store? Um, are you going to have a particular, you know, price point? Are you going to focus on hand dyes or um, more, you know, more um, mass, mass produced? I consider Noro and Rowan both to be mass produced versus hand dyes. Are you going to be focused? Are you going to focus on sweaters? Are you going to focus more on accessories? Because those kinds of decisions are going to drive how you stock your store and who you are purchasing from. Like we support, again, people who are making baby blankets, people who are making scarves, hats, crocheting, whatever. But we are definitely there to support the sweater knitter. So we are going to stock yarns wide and deep. So if you come in and you want to make a sweater and you're a, a 3X person, yeah, we have enough yarn for you. We don't have to special order it. We have that and we can help you make a sweater that is going to fit you and flatter you and that you're going to be proud to wear. So I think for a new yarn store owner, deciding um, how you want to serve and who you especially want to kind of cater to in addition to sort of all of the um, people who are coming in for this and that, and that will draw people to your space. Right. 
Well, I hope I'm going to have a chance to visit your store one day soon and we'll chat in public somewhere. We'll, we'll meet at some festival or other. I would love that. And you're going to be on, on my live. Yeah, I'm coming next to your channel. That's Yay! Really exciting to have the roles reversed and you're going to be asking me questions. So. Yeah. 